you know, we're going to give you some advice today, which is going to be some good ideas about how to, you know, what are the good ingredients to go into your head node or into your compute nodes and your cluster in general. But these aren't one way doors and they're also not major acts of labor. They're decisions that you need to make and they're decisions you can unmake if you don't like them. So you can afford to go with what looks like the best bit of advice. Go back and change them later if they don't work for you. When we design HPC clusters, we typically focus an awful lot on the compute nodes because that's where the action is going to be happening for, you know, for the compute cycles. Totally makes sense. But the, the user experience starts is, is typically exhibited at the head node. And so actually thinking about what goes into your head node can actually have quite a bit of impact on the end user experience. Uh, and of course, it's a separable problem to what goes on in the compute nodes. The head node is just a persistent EC2 instance in your cluster, and it's, it's responsible for several different tasks. One, it's where you or your users, if it's a multi-user cluster, log in, and this is where you submit jobs, manage data, and sometimes you install software and do a whole bunch of other things. So it's the interactive component. It's also where the Slurm control application is hosted. Um, and if your cluster uses Slurm accounting, it hosts the Slurm database manager. Um, it also hosts two NFS file systems that are shared out to all the compute instances, so your home directory and some of these slash opt directories. And then on a multi-user cluster, it coordinates with Microsoft Active Directory to manage users and groups on the system. And finally, if you use an nice ICDCV, it provides virtual desktop uh, streaming capabilities. That's actually quite a lot for one little EC2 instance, isn't it? That's right. It sure is. It means it's important to give some thought about how your head node is designed in parallel cluster. First thing we need to decide on is just your head node instance type. So we have to start by deciding what our CPU architecture is going to be. By default, you're probably going to want to use x86. That's Intel or AMD kind of traditional uh, processors. But if you want to compute on Graviton processors, then you select a Graviton instance type. If you want your head node to support accelerated graphics, then you need to uh, select an instance type with a GPU. Now, be aware that GPUs are in demand, um, and so it can be costly to leave one running all the time. Another way besides having your GPU attached to your head node is written up in a recent HPC um, blog article. Yeah, that's right. So Sean Smith actually wrote this up some time ago. So there's a, it's a good article about um, how to actually set up a queue, an actual cluster queue uh, with, with uh, GPU nodes in it. Uh, and then when you actually need to do some visualization, you just check out a node out of the queue and it spins one up dynamically for you. And when you're done, you're done and you chuck it away and you're not paying for it anymore. It's pretty cool. So now you need to decide your instance size. And this is where all of those balls in the air that are, are happening on the head node really come into play. Rather than the smallest size in an instance family, um, I would consider an extra large or a two extra large or instance size and those will have four or eight vCPUs, respectively. If you need to do any memory intensive data wrangling, like if you are going to load up data into, a, into pandas and slice it and dice it to create input files, um, you might need more RAM per CPU. So you could use an M family instance instead of a C instance or a T instance. Right. Um, and then, so we've got, a, we've got another tech short in the Tech Shorts Foundation series that'll actually help you understand the alphabet soup that is EC2 instance naming. Um, I'll put a link to that up on the screen as well. It's worth watching that. It's only a few minutes and you, you should be able to grok the, you know, the okay. assemblage here. But so right. next we have some, some settings under the head node instance. One is add SSM session. I recommend, first of all, that you turn this setting on, even if it's not on by default in parallel cluster UI. So SSM is short for AWS systems manager. Don't ask how that acronym maps to. AWS Systems Manager. Um, but what it does do is it lets you, the cluster operator, securely log into that head node right from the EC2 console. Yeah. I actually like this so much, especially when I'm doing a lot of work on a lot of different clusters. Um, I don't have to remember IP addresses. Um, I can just click on a link in a browser. Um, I've gone to the instances here. If I click on it, I will go to the EC2 management console and then I can click on connect. And I've given a choice of ways to connect, and I choose Session Manager. And here's where the magic happens. Watch this, folks. Boom. Uh, voila. Oh. 
Yeah, uh, I want to point out this is not just a nice to have feature though in the uh, in the in, in parallel cluster UI. Also, actually needed to enable DCV terminals, and there are some job management capabilities that are in PC UI, and we may be adding more job management capabilities to uh, to the uh, to the system. And as we do, they will be dependent on SSM. There's also not a downside to SSM. It does allow you, though, to build a cluster that is completely hermetically sealed off from the internet um, and only accessible via SSM. So if, if that's if that's your goal, that's actually a cool thing to be able to do. Definitely. If you're if you're if you're completely isolated, this is much better than setting up jump hosts and or bastions or, or whatnot. I mean, even if you have those, it's better than dealing with them. OK, now let's talk about adding DCV. If you turn this on on your head node, it means you can actually access the head node using a visual a graphical desktop. That's right. And to, to make it so, um, you simply click Add DCV, and a couple of things happen. But the most important thing that happens is all of the, like a, a, a desktop environment and the DCV server are installed and configured on your head node for you. Um, if you want to tweak the security a little bit, you can change the IPs. You can provide um, a CIDR range so you can restrict it to uh, your local corporate network or just your your own personal um, desktop IP address or whatnot. And as we mentioned before, um, DCV takes resources. It doesn't come for free in that sense. It, it does consume some compute resources. Mm -hmm. It can do a virtualized desktop for you, in which case it's going to put a fair amount of pressure on a CPU. So you may want to bump up your, your compute a notch or two in order to have enough CPUs available for it. If you're going to do really graphics intensive stuff, you really should get an instance type that's got a GPU. Okay, so so um, you know, yeah. by default, access to your head node is pretty locked down. It allows inbound, inbound connections on SSH and DCV. If you want to change this, you can add more security groups to the head node. So for instance, if you need to run a web server or yeah. um, you need to run a database management server and you need that port to be exposed, you can create a security group that allows that. You can attach that to your head node. You can also set up scripts that run automatically on your head node. These can be stored locally, kind of baked into the AMI that assumes you're using a, a custom AMI or more more commonly, they can be retrieved from a public URL. These are real helpful for customizing your parallel cluster installations. If you choose on node start, then this script runs right when the instance boots. And this is before parallel cluster um, starts getting in and configuring it to be part of a cluster. If you choose on node configured, it means that the script runs after the node is booted and after parallel cluster has configured it to be part of the cluster. And then if you choose on node updated, it sets the script to run any time that that instance is updated. Um, so as long as they're publicly accessible, they can be S3 buckets um, that are accessible. Um, another common place that people get, um, and this is this is because this is really easy. Um, you can check your scripts into a GitHub repository as long as it's public, and then use the raw .github content path to get access to that uh, to that file. This like this is the way that you download files from GitHub if you don't want to check it out. We're getting to the last bits now, which is local storage. Um, how do we how do we think about local storage on our head node? Yep. Okay. So the reason this is marked as optional is you really don't have to worry about it usually. Parallel cluster configures your head node with uh, a reasonably sized uh, elastic blob store disk. Um, it's about 35 gigs. Uh, that might not be the case all the time, but it's always about 35 gigs. For the business of managing users, running Slurm and accounting, if you're just doing basic login and job submission tasks, that's probably going to be fine. Um, I definitely wouldn't set it below 35 gigs. Um, honestly, EBS just isn't particularly expensive, but you can do something like 100, 200, 250. Um, I'm just going to set it to 100. The other thing you can do is you can change the volume type. Um, if you really find that your home directories are uh, are I/O limited, you can do something like choose a provisioned IOPS volume. But I will say that the default GP3 is really pretty good. If it's available yep. in your region, I would just go with it. I've never personally had to change it. So if you're following along home, uh, we're going to have more episodes in this series. We're going to talk about more principles of cluster design using PCUI as our design manager. Matt, 
Thanks for coming today and showing this to us. If you learned something from this talk, then please consider giving us a like and subscribing to the channel so you can find out when more videos like this are available. And if there's an area you'd like to see us go deeper into, uh, don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. See you next time. Oh,